How's it going guys? In this video, I want to give you a few pointers on how to optimize your code in Python. And that practically means the things you should consider when you are optimizing your code in Python. Now, a lot of people say that if you're trying to optimize your code in Python, then you just shouldn't be using Python. But that's like saying if you're trying to improve the speed of your bike, if you are a cyclist, then you shouldn't be using a bike, you should just use a car. There's a reason we're using Python, so there's nothing wrong with trying to improve the speed of the tool that we're using while we're using it. Sometimes adding some oil to the chain or pumping the tires more can make your bike perform a bit faster for essentially no extra cost. And the same goes for Python. Why wouldn't we want to get the best out of the tool that we have to use anyway? But the first thing you should consider before you try to optimize any of your code is how often you're going to run that script. If you're going to run it once a year, then optimizing it might not make any sense at all because if you have to wait one minute per year, that's perfectly fine. But now let's change the example to a script that you might run 20 times a day. If you find a way to optimize your code so it even saves you one second, you're saving 20 seconds per day. That's 7,300 seconds per year, which is approximately two hours per year. And imagine you have 1,000 users that use your app every day. Now that's 2,000 hours of time you saved everyone all because your block of code is now one second faster. So you really need to keep into consideration how much that optimization scales. Again, if it's for yourself and you run the script once a year, optimizing might indeed be a waste of time. But if there are a lot of users using your app, even if your app loads one second faster or runs one second faster, that's a drastic change on a larger scale. Anyway, with all that being said, let's jump into some of the practical tips that you should keep into account when you are trying to optimize your code. Because with Python being a high level language, it's very easy to get biased results. So for this example, I'm going to compare the speed of a list comprehension to the speed of a for loop. So here we create a list comprehension, which is of type integer, and we add 10 numbers to it using this range iterator. And we're going to do something similar using this for loop where we create a list and we append to that list the same 10 numbers from that iterator. So at the end of the day, they give us the exact same result with different approaches. And to time these two snippets, we're going to import from time it import repeat and I much prefer to use repeat over time it because it actually gives us the ability to easily repeat our tests a given amount of times, which is great for consistency. Anyway, below these two snippets of code, we're going to try to get the time for how long it took to execute each one of these 1 million times. And we're going to repeat this test five times for each one of these snippets of code. Now repeat is going to give us back a list of float, which gives us the best times from this test and we want to get the minimum from that because that will give us the best possible time or in other words, what our computer is actually capable of doing back to us as a result. And then below that, I'm going to print both of the results formatted nicely to three decimal places using formatted strings. Now, when we run this to actually compare the list comprehension to the for loop, you'll see that the list comprehension will perform a bit better. And that was a fairly simple benchmark. But again, there's a lot of things you can do wrong here. For example, if we were to just use the time it function, instead of using repeat, we can say, oh, this is going to be a lot of work, but this is what I get paid for. Time it, we're going to keep the number at 1 million and we're going to remove repeat. So it's still going to give us a float back, but we're only performing the test once. And I'm going to copy and paste that for the for loop. Now let's run that once again. And you're going to see that the results are a bit different. This time the list comprehension didn't really give us that boost or that speed boost, the list comprehension wasn't really that much faster. And if we run it again, it might be faster or it might be even slower. And that's something interesting that can vary from computer to computer. And for my computer, which is a MacBook M1, I believe this is due to the fact that I did not warm up the code because before Python gets to its peak performance, it needs to warm up the interpreter or it needs to load a lot of things, which means that once it runs the first test, it's not really at the working speed. When we use the repeat function, we minimize that risk because we're repeating that test five times, which means it will be able to get to that working speed to actually give us some accurate results. And to show you this, I'm just going to copy and paste this right above. And we're just going to call this warm up. It's not going to do anything. It's just going to perform a test before it performs the other two tests. 
And when we run this, you'll see that the list comprehension is going to be more accurate now because we were able to warm up our interpreter or warm up Python. And if we run it again, it's going to be more consistent. And sometimes the order in which you perform these can change the results as well. So when you're doing benchmarks, it's very important you keep everything into account. Not to mention that it also varies from Python version to Python version. If I change this to Python 3.9, the difference between a list comprehension and a for loop can be much bigger. Here it's around 25%, while in Python 3.12, it was more like maybe 10%. But let's change it back to what we had from earlier with repeat, because I prefer that much more. I mean, it might take ages, but it works much more consistently. Now, something else you might want to keep into account is that if you're performing any tests without the time it module, you're going to want to disable the garbage collector for more precise results. For example, here we can import garbage collector and you can just type in garbage.disable. And it's as simple as that to disable the garbage collector. By default, the time it module should disable the garbage collector, but when I manually disable it as well, I do get different results, so I'm a bit confused or a bit fuzzy about that when it comes to timing, when it comes to the time it module. Right now I'm back in Python 3.12, so when I run this code, you'll see that we'll get 0.168 for the list comprehension if I disable the garbage collector. But if I don't disable it before that, it's going to be something more around 1.75. And this is a consistent difference. So if any of you know anything more about that when it comes to the time it module, please leave it in the comment section down below because from the documentation, time it is supposed to disable that garbage collector. So I don't really understand why disabling it even earlier boosts the speed of the code. Anyways, I do want to reference an article which I found incredibly useful to performing or to actually doing benchmarks. And that's an article by Jason Brownlee. This is an incredibly insightful article that actually explains a lot on the best practices for Python benchmarking. And I absolutely recommend you look into this before you actually start trying to perform some benchmarks. Because I'm not going to lie, when I first started programming in Python, I would do something such as import time, then I would say start time, type float equals time dot performance counter. I would put some code inside here, and then I'll put end time, which will also be a, perform a performance counter. And then of course you would print the final time, which will be the total, which is end time minus the start time. And I would think this is a perfectly acceptable way of performing a test. But again, there's so much wrong with this approach. The first one being that we do not warm up the code so we can get we can have a lot of bias. Second, we're not repeating this test any amount of times. So we're also susceptible to that bias where we might get a good result depending on the mood of our computer. And while it might seem like a good idea at first because it's quite simple, it just isn't reliable. But anyway, do let me know in the comment section down below what you think about optimizing Python code, whether you have any tips and tricks, whether you have any articles you want to refer to that are quite insightful. I would love to hear about that in the comment section down below. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.